Bienvenidos a Nuestra América. Thanks for tuning in. This is Marcela Díaz with your statewide civil and workers' rights organization, Somos Un Pueblo Unido. We're going to start the year off with some climate justice experts from our own community to talk a little bit about what we can look forward to in 2022. And we are with Camila Feibelman. Did I say that right, Camila? With the, yeah. the Rio Grande chapter of the Sierra Club, which covers a part of West Texas as well as New Mexico, a strong and amazing policy ally. Uh, Sierra Club does a number of things, um, but really a big part of this major push to uh, to really make New Mexico one of the national leaders when it comes to climate policy, just transition issues. So thanks for joining us on Nuestra America, Camila. Thanks so much for having me. And it's great just to be in solidarity with Somos Un Pueblo Unido. Thank you. So we want to get a real strong sense of where have we been in 2021? I think it was kind of an impactful year when it comes to some of this climate legislation. So what are, what are some of the highlights in, in 2021? Yeah. And let me just frame that within what I would really call a climate crisis right now. You saw the Permian Basin being one of the few oil basins to quote unquote recover and come back to production well beyond what was being extracted before the pandemic. We're now the second largest oil producing uh, state in the country. And that means that we are a real and serious contributor to the climate crisis. And we can see how that plays out up in Boulder with ferocious fires in the middle of the winter, only to be followed by a huge dump of, of, of snow just a couple of days later. You know, just these really extreme weather events that are impacting us all around the globe, but then that can also affect our health on the ground. And so, you know, the 2021 legislature session was really one where we made some good progress. It wasn't transformative progress where we, you know, took the next step after the Energy Transition Act to move ourselves towards uh, leaving the oil and gas dependence that we have behind. But we did make some progress. For example, now the state can make stronger air quality rules than the federal rules. It used to be that we could only be as strong as the federal rules. Now we can go beyond that. Um, now the Environment Department has the ability to withdraw or deny permits for bad actors, um, people who are violating our air quality laws. So those are some key points of progress. Um, partners of ours help to pass community solar, which means that if you can't afford to have panels on your roof or live in a rental unit, that you can actually buy into a big solar system and do your part to get your electricity from solar. And then even just in our uh, realm of, of new rules. We passed some really good methane rules. We saw a hundred percent renewable replacement for the coal that's going to shut down at San Juan over the summer. Um, so good progress, but still a lot more to do. And so a lot of that is, is sort of new rules, new legislation, and, and some of that, like the like what's happening in San Juan is a direct result of the Energy Transition Act that passed in 2019. Did we do enough in 2020 and 2021 well, around the ETA to get that implemented? <laughs> it's good reason to be excited about the progress with it. So just to remind folks, the Energy Transition Act basically requires the big utilities in the state to start increasing dramatically the amount of renewables they're using to generate electricity with. So the three big utilities in the state have to be carbon free by 2045 and PNM has committed to getting there by 2040. So that means as we leave the coal fired power plants that we are replacing that with renewable energy. The Transition Act also gave the Public Regulation Commission much more authority to drive and decide what the replacement packages for these coal-fired power plants would be. So in the case of San Juan, you know, PNM wanted to bring in new natural gas, but we were able to show, along with our partners at the Coalition for Clean and Affordable Energy, that you could actually 
just on economics, replace that coal with just renewables and battery storage, and that most of it would be located directly in the impacted community, helping to replace that tax base, helping to build back some of the jobs. And then the last piece of that is that that we use a low rate bond to help pay off those plants earlier, save ratepayers money, and then also generate funds for community transition. That that last piece is still hung up in the Supreme Court where there had been a challenge to the Energy Transition Act. And we're waiting for a decision there with the hope that those funds will soon be generated and released. So I know that these organizations, including yours, work hand in hand with many of the tribal communities, including in the San Juan region. How is transition going? Because I mean, we're going to have a little bit later on in the show, James Poviwa, who's going to be the new chairperson of the Sustainable Economy Task Force, which was another big win, right? Like, well, how do we how do we replace and create new, cleaner, both in renewable energy, but just in other sectors as well? How are we going to replace generally a third of our state revenues when it comes to the yeah. oil and gas industry? What What can we learn from the San Juan experience this in this last year that that can really help us map what is going to happen in the Permian Basin. Yeah, well, you know, I think with this with the Four Corners area, you know, we have seen the coal economy just bottom out globally. And so what had been the cheapest energy around is no longer that because finally, in part, these companies are having to pay for the damage that they do to our water quality, our air quality, to our community health. And so we know that this transition is happening both energy and economically. So we can let it happen to us and hope for the best and you know just deal with the fallout or we can attempt to plan for it. Now in the oil and gas world, that's gonna be a little bit more complicated. It's a lot more diffuse. There are many more companies involved. Um, you know, there are more workers um, in different situations, some transplants, some people who've been here for a long time. But in all cases, if we're not planning ahead and well in advance, we're going to have a problem. You know, New Mexico, for example, doesn't have any manufacture of wind, the technology that goes along with industrial wind. So there's a lot of planning that we can do. The renewable industry isn't going to replace every fossil fuel job one-to-one, -one, but that's kind of a sign of the need for a diversified economy. And even federally, um, there's a look to see if there would be a way to create kind of a flat state income based on what had been oil and gas income um, to help states level out over time. But I think there are two urgencies. One is that we have got to stop emitting greenhouse gases into the air, or we create a planet for our kids that is simply inhabitable. And you can already see that island nations that are having to flee and evacuate fires that incinerate instead of serve their natural role in our ecosystems, droughts that just don't stop. Our snowpack evaporates before spring even gets here. And so we don't have the runoff. And you have farmers who just can't take the water rights that they supposedly have because there's no water. So if we don't do something about this and tap into these federal laboratories, the great mines that we have in the state, we have a major problem and we can let this happen to us or we can work together and plan around it and really drive an approach to this problem that is based on a deep knowledge of this land, of our of solutions that we haven't even thought of yet. And it appears that we have people in every level of government here in New Mexico who are really willing to tackle this. And the Sierra Club, as well as Somos and so many other organizations, were a part of putting together what I thought was a pretty phenomenal a climate conference that the speaker's office really put together, but <laughs> we all sort of advised on different aspects of this, right? The At the climate conference, there were a lot of, the, the idea was let how many different, you know, from New Mexico communities, as well as experts from around the country, what are some of sort of the best and, and most doable in some cases, radical in other cases, <laughs> policies that we could, and approaches that we could as a state move forward and so there were a lot of ideas that were generated, but 
the a big buzz came from the governor said that she wanted New Mexico to create some policies and legislation in 2022 that would help sort of put together a map towards making us net carbon neutral by 2050. I think if so, you know, we we were all very excited by the announcement at the conference, and I'll, I'll explain why. So we had tried tried to pass comprehensive climate legislation in the last session. But there was a lot going on, early childhood education, paid sick leave. You know, there was a lot of low hanging fruit that we needed to attend to. And, um, you know, I think that we had thought that the administration wanted to wait until the next 60 day session to take action on, on climate legislation. The governor announced that she would enshrine her climate executive order from 2019 into law and include net zero by 2050. Now, some people get nervous about this idea of net zero by 2050. I mean, it's basically the standard term that most global governments are referring to. If that's all you do, well, then it's not enough. And we can all kind of hang up our hats and go home and, you know, to stop the damage and then we have to repair. Right. (laughs) But, you know, the governor's executive order actually deals with nearer term carbon reductions. And so what we're hearing is that the bill will include um, 50 percent reductions of greenhouse gases um, by 2030. And that's 5% more reductions than in her executive order. And that all of that would be direct reductions. And we're talking about from a 2005 emission standard. So that is huge. And anybody who would oppose a bill that includes that, I think needs to seriously question their commitment to climate progress. Um, we haven't seen a copy of the bill though. So, you know, we have to see what it's going to say, see what it's going to do. And the most important thing for this moment is near term action on direct greenhouse gas reductions. Um, And so we'll be working hard to make sure that that happens in this coming 30 day session. I I think, and and we're going to wrap up because we're going to, on the second after our break, going to hear from James Povihua on the Sustainable Economy Task Force and how we can ensure that people's jobs are being replaced and that we're investing in workforce development. But I think that one of the the things that I often think about when it comes to, you know, piecemeal strategies on, on, on climate policy is that I'm like, how are we fitting into the bigger picture? Like, we need bold movement at the obviously international level, at the national level, but we hear from states doing these amazing things. And I'm like, how does it all fit into the bigger picture? And I think something that really stuck with me, Camilla, is is when when you say we're the sickest, the the sickest, we are the sickest and the second biggest producer uh, in the country, I think it's really important that folks know that what we do in New Mexico will have a big impact in the country and in the world. That's right. And you add on top of that, that New Mexico feels the impacts of climate change at a much greater rate than most places because of our heat, because of our drought, because of forest fires. You know, all of this is braided into what really is an integrated need to address climate and economic justice. And, you know, there's not one way to deal with it. It's not like the pandemic where we stay home, we get vaccinated and wear masks good. We're good to go. We have to deal with every aspect of our lives from electric generation to what we put in our tank, um, to what happens when we turn the light on in our home, to where we work, to what we breathe, to what we, um, you know, work at to sustain our lives. So it's complicated. It's a tapestry, but we all represent a thread in that tapestry and we all have to weave together to find those solutions to make sure that people have livelihoods that that feel good to them, that result in a living wage, that are healthy and safe. And at the same time that we're creating an environment where our air is clean, our water is clean. Um, and without thinking about it in that integrated Um, complex way, we're not going to get the solutions we need. So it can be hard and it can feel like we're shoving the apple in our mouth. But if we take one bite at a time and work together, we'll get there. Well, we have such a vibrant advocacy community around these issues uh, that are incredibly informed and also very committed to those deep equity principles. And so we really appreciate you. uh, Mm -hmm. And thanks for explaining to us what sort of the highs 
the highs and lows uh, of 2021 and what we have to look forward to in 2022. So uh, Camilla Feldman, F Feldman, I'm giving you a different <laughs> name, um, Feibelman from uh, the Rio Grande chapter of the Sierra Club. Thank you, Marcela. Today, we are very excited to have join us at Somos Un Pueblo Unido on Nuestra America, James Povijua. We've known him for a few years now. He was the former policy director of the Center for Civic Policy and is currently the co-chair of the Sustainable Economy Task Force, uh, which is full steam ahead uh, with the state of New Mexico and with many partners, including Somos Un Pueblo Unido, uh, particularly our members in the Southeast. Uh, Nuestra America listeners, know that Somos Un Pueblo Unido has been engaged for the last few years in a broad climate policy movement, but with a focus and a lens on diversifying New Mexico's economy, providing alternative jobs to the fossil fuel industry, which can be very hard on families and workers in southeastern New Mexico, and really providing and amplifying the voice, uh, not of the oil and gas men uh, and the owners of these industries, uh, but also the, the workers and the families that have really been fueling this part of our economy uh, and who really want some alternatives and some more options in our community. Who wouldn't want that? Thanks, James, for participating on West America. Thanks, Marcela. It's really great to be here again. Um, and I know we're several days into the new year, but very happy new year to you and all your listeners. Um, I am very excited about 2022 and looking forward to um, building off of all of the incredible work that happened in 2021. And uh, the years in the buildup to a lot of the initiatives that really started to move in 2021, both in the legislature, and um, through the great support of uh, key elected officials in our administration. And we're faced with very real climate change issues that are impossible to ignore. Um, in New Mexico, so many of us uh, community members are experiencing things like extreme heat days and we all know about the terrible wildfires that continue to happen year to year. Uh, so I have came into this work at the real interest of the intersection between um, community, climate change, and workers' rights, and the need to create new jobs, especially uh, back in 2019, and you know all about this, but the passage of the Energy Transition Act and the real concern that our communities uh, would be left behind in a transition away from the extractive industry. And when you say we're concerned about our communities be left, being left behind, what does that mean specifically? Because I know it's a part of our broader equity principles that we've been a part of in, in creating for the state as it moves forward on climate policy. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when I say the real concern about communities being left behind, uh, you know, this is a long term transition. Our state needs to be able to define an, an economy that is diversified away from solely the extractive industry, which we're very dependent on right now. But at the same time, there are significant and in very important good paying jobs that are within that industry. Um, so we need to make sure that whatever economy is developed in the long term is bringing all New Mexicans along. You know, to that end, as you're talking about, there needs to be deep thought about how can we create uh, something new, something that is, you know, long term and sustainable for the state that doesn't, um, you know, creates jobs and also does not destroy our air, land and water. So, as you know, Somos and Power for New Mexico partners uh, have been working towards this end for years. Uh, back in 2019, you all organized and were able to get the funding and the mandate for our Department of Labor, the DWS uh, Department of Workforce Solutions, to be able to conduct a study about the opportunities and barriers for rural and um, immigrant and um, Black, Indigenous people of color communities to be able to uh, take advantage of these new opportunities in the renewable energy fields. That study, as you know, uh, Somos and many other community partners participated in, and it was a real snapshot uh, because it was a snapshot of uh, what we may see with the 
um, tanking of an oil and gas industry and the uh, pandemic. So what I mean by snapshot is that it was conducted at the height of the pandemic. And also last year, we'll all remember that the oil and gas industry was also in a slump. Um, so it was a real picture of what, uh, what our community communities were experiencing, um, the pain and the, and the real concern about putting food on the table and remaining safe. So- yeah. That's a really good point. It was done at the it was done in April in May, sort of at the onset of the pandemic when people were not working. They were just out of work. Eventually they got back to work, but you know, a lot of folks in southeastern New Mexico will budget for these exact kinds of lows and highs. It just went extremely low and people completely lost their jobs. And so it was a so it really was a reminder of the volatility of this industry in general. There was a process, a community process to develop equity principles um, that may be applied to climate uh, policy in the state. And, you know, I was so happy that uh, I was be able to be part of that community process, as were you, Marcella. Um, and, you know, the principles that came out of that, I think, can really serve to uh, ensure that um, policies that are good for the climate are also good for community. Mm -hmm. So what are some of that, what are some of those um, equity principles that now the state that it's adopted um, can have to sort of use throughout the process as we continue to consider new climate legislation? In the climate bill and in climate policy in general, folks should be looking at principles regarding process to develop and implement those policies, in particular, engaging overburdened communities. As I said before, respecting tribal sovereignty and requiring collaboration and con consultation. Uh, and third, maintaining accountability and transparency. And then when those um, climate principles are being developed around design and their effects, um, they sh folks should consider incorporating traditional knowledge and experience of New Mexicans, advancing equitable economic transition, a just transition, prioritizing and creating uh, and maintaining universal access to utilities, which we talked on a little bit, Marcella, and finally reducing health and environmental impact. The other things that need to be uh, really looked at are uh, you know, what sorts of uh, jobs are created within uh, the policies that are being developed? Um, also, are there negative impacts, for instance, uh, when you come to policies like electrification um, that is really moving, um, for instance, households over to electrified appliances? Uh, are there barriers for low to moderate income families to be able to make that transition so that, you know, they're not left behind in a system that is becoming more expensive? Uh, what we've seen is that workers need supports to be able to make a transition into a new industry. And so um, Power for New Mexico designed a project, a pilot project to um, provide stipends and supports to workers um, to make a transition into a clean energy job. And when we say clean energy, you know, I think we're thinking about a broad, um, broad set of, uh, of professions that may not just be wind and solar. They may be land reclamation. They might be an outdoor tour, outdoor recreation and tourism. Um, and, you know, uh, we all need to think creatively about what a new economy looks like. And that's what our project would also look like to encourage workers to, you know, be employed in a field that is not, um, you know, committing, com excuse me, contributing to climate change. Yeah. And so what can we expect from the Sustainable Economy Task Force in 2022? We are, you know, who, who is a part of it? Um, you know, what, what, what are some of the outputs that we can see and look forward to? And how can we participate in it? So the task force itself is made up of various cabinet uh, secretaries or their designees um, and led by the secretary of the Economic Development Department or her designee. The co-chair is from the community advisory group, and that's where I come in. Um, as you know, many of our uh, uh, 
uh, community members were able to uh, be appointed to the uh, Sustainable Economy Advisory Committee. Uh, and that is what I am chairing as well. Yeah. So there's there are a lot of ideas out there. It, it feels uh, daunting. <laughs> it is daunting to co- create new industries, uh, but it's kind of pressing. No one is proposing people lose their job one day. It's what we need to put into place right now so that as we transition in the next 20 years, people really have an opportunity in these communities to continue to live and thrive and grow in the communities that they've chosen to call home um, for the last 15 to 20 years. And so that's really why Somos Un Pueblo Unido has been a big part of this and why so many of our members are gung-ho about really creating some long-term and medium-term solutions in relation to this. So hopefully the task force is a really great vehicle, the sustainable economy task force for our folks to have a strong voice in this. Thank you so much, James, for participating with us on West America, and we will be back next Tuesday.